Good morning, Teacher Honey. Oh, <laughs> and everybody, welcome to the Early Childhood Early Show. <laughs> that was the rainbow. Can we yeah. Like, yeah. just picture a rainbow? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Oh, too close. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Oh, cheers. <laughs> All right. To the point we have some show and tell we do um and you get to go first this morning oh well should we talk about who we are a little first oh let's sure that show and tell let's what let's do that show and tell like who are you why are we here? oh okay yeah you do you first hmm. cool so my name is tiffany pearsall and i am a preschool teacher i've been teaching preschool for 10 almost 11 years, which feels like a long time. That is a third of my life. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's weird. That is a third of your life. Huh? Um, I recently opened a nature play school in the middle of nowhere. And I work with um, infants and toddlers and preschoolers. And we adventure in the woods. And I have a three-year-old as well. And we wake up before 6 a.m. every day. So early. Oh, so early. Cheers to that one. <laughs> um, Kristen, tell us about you. So I have been in the field of early childhood education for 10 years. Did you say 10 too? Yeah. Oh, we started at the same time. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, and I have a nature and play-based preschool in Minnesota that opened six years ago. And um, also have Learning Wild, which is my online presence that I love to use to teach other people about all things early childhood. Yeah. 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 What's the name of your, so like Learning Wild is where we can find out more about you. What's the name of your school? And where is it? Preschool. Butterfly Hill Nature Preschool, and it is in Alexandria, Minnesota. And tell us yours. Um, I um, work at Play Frontier out in Carson, Washington, which is like right, you know how Washington and Oregon, there's like a beep, beep, beep on Oregon? A beep, beep, beep. Yep. Like right in there. Right there. But we're on the Washington side. You are. And it's beautiful there. I think it's prettier because you get to see the Oregon Mountains, but like get all the sunshine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And you have like a gorge in your backyard. It's true. It's literally gorgeous in the Columbia River Gorge. Yeah. yeah. So our, our, we're going to be doing show and tell on our show. Yeah. And so Tiffany. Show and tell, tell for grownups. For grownups for really like early childhood educators and parents of right yeah. yeah yeah so like, we're gonna yeah, share everything they do their sharing time or they like bring in special stuff to share and yeah. like I'm like I try to share the things that are exciting to me with the kids and sometimes it works but most of the time it's like I want another adult to participate with me because that's where exactly at. yeah okay so I'm here to participate with you Fanny mm-hmm what you got I'm here teacher honey okay <laughs> so <clears throat> I can't wait this is an acorn <gasps> in a cleaned out old syrup bottle this is a special acorn because when Kristen and her daughter Channing came to visit all of the acorns were just starting to germinate. And so the acorns had like little, you could see just like, like they were sticking their little. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we, Channing and I pocketed a few. And it was like this grand experiment. Would they grow? So um, I took a couple of mine and I put them, um, I put one in like a baggie with a wet paper towel. And then I put one like balanced on the top with water down below, wondering if they were looking for the water. And then this one is the only one that grew. Oh. And I had like the little butt of it where the, mm, I guess that isn't the butt, that's the other end. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> the... <laughs> the coming out, I had it touching the water and it just like boo, grew roots. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah. And now it's a little baby oak tree. Channing's, so we brought one home. Yeah. Channing has it in a little container and it's like nothing. But she thinks it is and she's so excited. But it's like doesn't have roots or anything and it doesn't there's like still the same little tiny at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And that is the bottom. That was the other thing I learned. That's like oh! not the plant growing up. That's the root growing down. So does that part need to go down then? Yes. Yes. So we should maybe switch it around. Mm -hmm. Although if it's turned brown, all hope might be lost. Yeah, it might be brown. But I don't know. Try. So tell me what you're going to do with that. Um, so right now I'm just like changing the water about once a week. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've noticed it kind of has like a funky fungus starting to grow on the roots. So I think it might be ready to transplant into some soil somewhere. Mm. I don't know, but it's been really fun to watch it grow. And like, you can see the difference between the old roots and the new roots. Wow. It's That's so incredible. It's been really fun to watch it grow and it just sits in a window and grows. Um, so this is water propagation. Oh, wow. There are so many different types of propagation and why, so there are lots of reasons also why I wanted to share it with you today. <laughs> picked it up together and look at what I it's, know. But as far as working with young children goes, you don't have to teach them, you don't have to direct teach them any of this. You don't have to know yeah. this going into it. You just have to notice something and try things. Yeah. And so my son has been along for the ride too. And like, this is the one that lived. And so he gets to watch it and see. That and now every time he sees an acorn with a little, he knows like, oh, it's a baby oak tree. <gasps> and he says that, he says, oh, baby oak tree. And that is so um, cool. Yeah. It's also all about the vocab for stuff like this. Which mm -hmm. typically you call STEM learning, right? Science, yeah. technology, and engineering, engineering math, and machine. What is the N? Math. Math. Why is yeah? Bi like biology is biology just the science? Science. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, it's just, all all lumped together. Like STEM annoys me because it's like, isn't everything really STEM? Like you have to <laughs> well, do the other things to understand the STEM. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Well, there's like STEM and then STEAM and then STEAM too. So like art. And what's our research? Research. Yeah, so this would be research too. Totally. Um, with young kids, the focus is mainly on experimenting. You don't have to know what's going to happen as the teacher. Mm -hmm. and sometimes you do, and you and you watch them do things. And you're like, mm, that's not going to work. Like chanting in the weird floating <laughs> Tupperware. Like I don't. <laughs> like it's your job to support the research. Like, what are you? Mm -hmm. Huh? Is that working? I don't know. And sometimes you just have to butt out and like, you know, it's not going to work, but they have to experience that and right. live through it and try it before they can really see what does and doesn't work. Um, Do you find as an adult huh? now having a nature play school, mm -hmm. do you find yourself being more curious and more wondrous about the natural world and like totally geeking out like more than you did as a child. Yes. You're living through the wonder of the children. Yes. So much so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we're the thing that we do more than anything else at nature school is vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and like, I'll call it environmental literacy more than vocabulary. And that, like that. Um, it's not just an acorn, it's an oak tree. And it's not mm -hmm. just an oak tree, it's a white oak or organ oak or Gary oak. They're all words for the same thing. And so then like, it's building that, that thought of like, not every acorn is gonna turn into the same oak tree and not every tree is the same type of tree and like really yeah. think about it. Um, what's been coming up for us a lot during quarantine is that it's 
um, the beginning of butterfly season out here. Yeah. So seeing all these little blue and white butterflies. And so instead of calling it a butterfly, let's call it a fender's blue. Let's call it a white cabbage. And just giving that additional vocabulary doesn't just empower a child to know what that is that they're looking at, but it says to them, there's more than one type of white butterfly. Yeah. So mind blown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's there's a word for nature blind. Is that the word? I don't know. I think nature blind is the term I'm looking for here where, okay. um, as a culture, we see green and we say that's nature. Yeah. I want kids who come through my program and my own children to see green and say, is that a fir tree? Isn't that interesting? I right, right. Of orchids will find underneath because the pH level is different between a fir tree and a spruce tree. Like, Mm -hmm. I want them to think about the world as all these big systems, not just like, that's where the green is. We go there to be (laughs) like, we're in. (laughs) And that's why I say that vocabulary is the biggest part of our nature school, and really all of play, in my opinion. Building that vocabulary strengthens all the neural connections so that you understand the world better, even if it's just by learning that one word today. So your word for today is propagation. Propagation. (laughs) That is absolutely fantastic. And I really feel like you need to send me a picture of that so I can show it to Channing because she will be so excited. Definitely. Definitely. And then you'll have to remember where you plant it so that when we come back, we can show it to her. Yeah. I think I'm going to plant it at school. Yeah. I'm going to wait until all the kids are back. And then we'll look at it for a while and talk about propagation. This, propagation. This oak mm-hmm. tree growing from an acorn. The acorn's still hanging around too, which is funny. Yeah. Like it's just this little nubbin. It's not going anywhere yet. Interesting. I have so many questions. But then we'll plant it somewhere on the playground so we can keep tabs on it. Totally. Hmm, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing, Fanny. Oh, you're welcome, teacher honey. I'll just plant my little plant right here for the rest of our show so it can listen. Is it my turn? Is it my turn? Is it my turn? Is it my turn? Yes! (laughs) Okay. So, um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, um, so if you're watching this, like, at a later time, we're we're in the middle of the coronavirus. And there is online school, distance learning happening everywhere. Mm-hmm. And there are many early childhood programs that have had to move online. Mm-hmm. Um, and across a chart meant for preschoolers, and I, I have no idea who the original creator of this chart is. I found it floating around um, online, so I don't know who created it, mm-hmm. but I wanted to show it you so that we could discuss how we can maybe make things um, more developmentally appropriate for preschool children because the expectations I think for um, are a little out of place I think for three four and five year olds so you have to tell me what you think do you want to see it what are we gonna do developmentally appropriate mean Developmentally appropriate means that um, we are educating the whole child in all of the developmental areas, so language and literacy, cognitive, physical, and social and emotional, um, in a manner that is aligned with their um, culture and um, community and place in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, taking all of that into account Mm -hmm. and the, the needs that they have for like, according to like child development at those ages, um, taking that into, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Consideration when planning any sorts of activity or anything for children, environment, whatever it may be. Totally. So it's like, um, 
factoring in what we know about how brains grow and how brains learn and making sure mm -hmm. we're tailoring that experience to the age of the child in question. Exactly. Totally. So you're like, you're so, not going to make a three-year-old sit through a college lecture. Right. That's because that's, there, but yeah, exactly. That's, it's not developmentally appropriate and we wouldn't expect it. Mm -hmm. However, I think that there are expectations right now as distance learning that are a little bit out of whack with developmentally appropriate practice for early childhood. And so I wanted to show this Zoom call chart. So this was a chart given to um, probably the parents of preschool children. Mm -hmm. And it is what to do when on a Zoom call. So the first should we go through yeah. each one and well, then just yeah, talk about can how you read them from here. So can you read them out loud for me? Yeah. And then we'll talk about how to make it more developmentally appropriate. Yeah. Um, so the first one is pretend you're sitting at the carpet at school. Hmm. So how could we make that expectation? Well, first of all, maybe we should talk. Right. Can you read them all and then we'll go through each one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Because I was also going to say we probably need to talk about the developmentally appropriateness of um, Zoom calls in general. Yeah. And we'll, and what, and maybe we can do that after we do this and what we could suggest as an alternative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So pretend you're sitting at the carpet at school. Okay. Make sure you're sitting in one spot. Okay. Everyone will be muted. So there's no extra noise. Raise your hand if you have something to say. Okay. Just like you wouldn't get up and leave the carpet, don't leave the Zoom call until it's time. Mm -hmm. Remember to be respectful of your friends and what they have to say. And then follow the conversation. Talk about what is being discussed. So let's, let's back up. I have so many things to say. I don't know. Um, are Zoom calls at all? developmentally appropriate um i, I think that they could that so uh, i need to back up even further than that <laughs> thinking about a zoom call zoom is an avenue for a teacher and a student to connect virtually how do you use that in a developmentally appropriate way right so it's the tool it's the tool. What would a, what should preschool teachers and um, parents of young children being expecting of that tool? Right. Um, I think that there's so many layers to this because there are school districts who are um, paying their mm -hmm. preschool teachers to provide an education and i'm doing that in air quotes because um and this is a whole nother video probably i mean i just truly believe that learning is intrinsic and people learn when they're ready on their own time um we can pretend that kids are like learning when we have a circle time and um are maybe doing some drill and practice things but um I think the schools are paying. So they, Eric, the expectation is that you will provide an online distance sort of something for these families. And unfortunately, it's taking developmentally appropriate practice and just throwing it out the window. Um, some, a lot of these expectations aren't appropriate for three, four, and five year olds. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, I will go ahead and say that every single thing on that zoom call chart you just showed are things that i would not do in person with real children which Same. is my biggest struggle with it right yeah it's yeah not, it's not the actual zoom call that is the problem it's how you're using this tool yeah you're using it in ways that are developmentally not appropriate right so um tell us what Assuming, I'm making the assumption that this is for a Zoom circle time. Yeah. Let's, should we make that assumption and go from there? Yeah. So is, yeah. if this is a, a Zoom circle time, mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and you, the tool wasn't there. Like, what would your circle time look like in a developmentally appropriate, right? A developmentally appropriate circle time. Totally. Um, before I say that, I will say that I believe Bev Boss said this for children, but I believe it for all humans that you have to do too much before you know how much is enough. Yeah. I have done every variety of circle time under the sun. <laughs> Me too. And I constantly go back and forth between how much is the right amount? Should I even do it at all? Like what, finding that balance I think is different for every single group of children and for every child at every moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, I currently don't like circle time at all mm -hmm. <laughs> because I have a very young group of kids that just doesn't want that. It's yeah. overwhelming. It's hard to sit in one place. They want that. They're so egocentric that they need me to be in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them to enjoy the songs. Mm -hmm. And because they are seeking that one-on-one because -on -one, they aren't able to handle the big group means every child is seeking that one-on-one -on -one at the same time. And it's just like, yeah, this isn't fun for ever anyone. Why? No, no. Right. Um, so my preferred method is more of a gathering than a yeah. time where we're going to do a thing. If you want to come join us, cool. If you mm -hmm. don't, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. I've also found that for things that I feel need a direct instruction or whole group participation, doing it while we eat is much more valuable. We're all stuck here together. If you mm -hmm. don't want to pay attention, there's this thing in front of you that's much like that's equally interesting, sometimes more yeah. interesting, sometimes less interesting. Yeah. But it, it's just like a natural time for us to have our big community talks. Like um, on Valentine's Day, I busted out the chalkboard and we talked about ways to love each other as friends. Mm -hmm. And it just felt natural and easy and no one was like, if yeah. you're running, you got to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. And if you need right. to interrupt to tell me something, then tell me, or maybe I'll ask you to wait till someone's done finishing their thought. Yeah. But you're not going to sit in one place the whole time. I yeah, no, I think the expectation for kids to sit in one spot, it's very, very difficult because, well, even just asking them to sit and remain seated in a certain way isn't necessarily developmentally appropriate because everybody's body is different mm -hmm. and our bodies are made to move to learn. Mm -hmm. And so the expectation of having everybody sit down in one spot and not move. Um, I struggle with that one. Yeah. I have kids in my, so my circle time currently is, um, we do a, a whole group cleanup and then, um, we split into small groups because we have like three teachers in our classroom. And so we split the class into three different groups based on developmental level. And so mine, generally, I have the kids who are heading off to kindergarten in my circle time. And we sing. Mm -hmm. We move. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to sing and you don't have to move if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, we read a story. And if you want to listen while laying down, you can listen while laying down. If you want to listen while you're going to get a drink of water, you may listen while you're going to get a drink of water. If you want to sit crisscross applesauce, because that's comfortable for you, you can sit crisscross applesauce. We read a story. We do a little, I don't know, sometimes there's a question and we all answer and you don't have to answer if you don't want to answer. And then we go to the bathroom and get ready to go outside. Yeah. So that is it's like, there's no calendar. There's no days of the week song or months of the year. I, I honestly have no idea. Where did that come from? Where in standards? Like, is there any standards? I know there's not in the Minnesota standards. Yeah. Like where did the calendar, the days of the week and the months of the year come into play? Like when did that become something that has to be done at circle time? 
right? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it came from the same place that we teach the kids the colors and the names of the colors, like eight times in their lives. Right. Like that's, they know it. Why are we so Right. <laughs> right. Also like, yes, it's a red, but it's more crimson. It's more brick red. <laughs> There are, there are vocabulary words for this right? that, that bring up better conversations. Let's have meaningful conversations. I think that's what this is coming to, too. Like with the Zoom call, circling back to it, it's not having an, a meaningful conversation if you have a captive audience. If they have to participate or they have to just sit still and be quiet the whole time, that's not a meaningful conversation. So why are you wasting everyone's time? I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me at all? No, you're back. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that was weird. Um, meaningful conversations, for sure. So what do you think about following the conversation and talk about what is being discussed? Hmm. That's... You have to do too much before you know the right amount. Mm -hmm. You have to say all the things that come to your head before you know how to go back and forth and have a conversation on a topic. And that doesn't yeah. start till you're like five. Yeah. Yeah. I just am left with this face about it. I know. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean I'm not going to teach you how to stay on topic with a conversation. Right. Like, like if we're, if I, you know, we're talking about, I don't know, what's a, shoot a topic at me we're talking about dinosaurs okay and somebody says like i went to the supermarket yesterday like you're gonna acknowledge that and say oh you did oh we're talking about yeah. dinosaurs do you want to add something about dinosaurs no cool thanks for telling me like so <clears throat> why is this a big deal why right so maybe the word down here, like, should not be conversation because a conversation is a two way. Uh, let's talk about what we're both interested in. Right. Like a meaningful conversation, mm -hmm. not we're only going to converse about what I think is important because I'm the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to have a conversation with you. So what are you interested in? So. Right. I think conversation maybe is the wrong word to use for a whole group zoom call because it's not a conversation if you have to unmute and mute people right and raise I your hand you, if you're muting everyone the whole time why not just pre-record it and send it to families to show when they have time right that, Agreed. that uh, the other another layer of this we're asking kids to be here in real time we're asking parents to make time in their day. Yeah. It has to be worth their time. Right. And so what at this moment is actually worth their time? Yeah. And I think it's always you, relationships with yep. each other and relationships with grown-ups who love them. Do you want to know what I just did? What did you just do? I was, like I've been thinking so much about Zoom and I can see the benefits of it. I kids enjoy being able to see each other's faces and stuff yeah. but I mean just again it's a, having the parents take time out of their day to get it set up for their child and 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 whatnot and so I just created a Marco Polo profile for teacher honey and sent it to all of the parents and said if you want all of us set this up for your kids and I will twice a day check all my Marco Polos and I will reply individually to everyone oh. and then I'm putting us all in one big group chat too so then oh. people they can all see each other's videos I love it that's so if you right I found somebody was doing it on Instagram like she, it wasn't like she said here's what I'm doing it was like a, a little comment somewhere she right. said something about I loved the Marco Polo that your child sent me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like, why didn't I think of this? So I did that this morning and I've already like sent out so many messages. Oh, I and I am it. so excited. Oh, that's like, But part. that's like, that's meaningful. And that's still keeping that connection. And you can still ask like inquiry-based questions. Like, 
Mm -hmm. Um, so today I, all of them this morning, I just said, show me something that you're doing or you found outside today. And so we'll see what comes back. I don't know what's going to come back, but I'm pumped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to be so fun. And that's like continuing that truly child-based, child-led education. Yes. You would be doing that in a classroom. Yes. And now you get to do it from home at their house. That's brilliant. I'm copying that. Right? So that's (laughs) something that you can do instead of Zoom. What are some other things we can do instead of um, unrealistic, maybe non-developmentally appropriate things for young children? Like, um, well, maybe that's a whole other topic for another day. Because I think we covered Zoom. Yeah. And we wanted to cover Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe for show and tell, I'll show something different next time that elaborates on it. I will say we are trying our first toddler happy hour Zoom call with everybody on Monday. Oh, my goodness. And I can't wait. Like, I tell, can't wait, tell what you're, what is it going to be like? It's just going to be a whole bunch of kids looking at each other, making noises. I mean, it's going to be chaos. No one's going to be on mute. No. But they're going to just be reminded that they have friends who love them, who miss them. Yeah. Yes. And I think that that's what's important about Zoom. If you're going to use Zoom, use the tool, use it in a way where we can make connections with each other. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I also can't, I can't bring myself to hate on people that are doing the best they can with what they have. Exactly. Plenty. I mean, Zoom also is a great tool for older grades. Yeah. Thinking about the college lecture format, we could be doing that. Like, what about being there in real life at real time is necessary? Just videotape it to me, and then I can watch it in my pajamas? Right. Pause to get a snack and not miss anything? Sounds great. Exactly. (laughs) Well, and I think, I think, too, like, it's important for us to let anybody who's watching this know, no matter where you are in your teaching journey for early childhood education or parenting journey, we are all doing the best that we can with the knowledge that we have. So we are trying to spread a little bit of knowledge about developmentally appropriate things, um, running developmentally appropriate programs and what that looks like. And this is all coming from our own experience because at one time or another, you and I both ran a very teacher-led programs. Yeah. Um, and have I made have the switch really, over. I had some really pretty lesson plans. <laughs> I had some really good crafts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I also have to come back to every teacher wants to do the best they can with the tools that they have. And mm-hmm. so making sure that when you're doing, trying something new like this, are you doing it for the children or are you doing it so that you feel like you're doing something? Mm -hmm. Because if you're really doing it for the children and you're really doing it because you want them to continue learning and continue feeling connected, then I would argue this is not the way to accomplish that. Right. By this, I mean the zoom visual story thing you shared, whatever that, how to, right, right. like, if yeah. you're really trying to continue a child's learning and stay connected with them, that's not going to do that. They're going to be mm-hmm. bored, mad that you made them put on pants and like want to <laughs> tell you about the turkeys that were in their yard yesterday. Like they're not, yes, you aren't accomplishing what you think you're accomplishing by that Zoom call. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Lisa Murphy would say, whose needs are being met? What does she say? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And who is it for? Yes. And mm-hmm. with the teacher led Zoom call, it's for the teacher because somebody else wants you to do something. And like, it's not for the kids. It's for right. the kids. It's so that the administration is satisfied. And then so the parents. It looks to the parents like you're doing something. Doing something, exactly. How often, have you met a single preschool parent that's like, please, can you have my child engaged in a Zoom lesson sitting in one place for four hours today? 
I have not. However, I have received, I did receive an Instagram message um, saying that the parents of children in her program are begging for things to make their children sit so that they can get work done. Yeah, that's a different thing. That's a different thing for another day. I mean, that that's, this might be a good segue into that, but you know, if the goal is children in one place being obedient, I think you might want to rethink what it means to be a child. Yeah. Right. And I know. at the same time, like if you want a kid to sit in one place for a long time, have you thought about giving him a box of cardboard and paint? Like, right. You've got, yeah. You're buying yourself an hour or two in yeah. the painting, and then you just throw all the stuff minus the cardboard in the shower with them because you're at home, and you buy <laughs> yourself another hour where they paint the whole shower, and then yes, you squirt the dish soap in, and that's another hour of <laughs> the shower, like yes. minimal little crumbs from the parent who's working, maximum learning the whole time. So I just think that as educators, we need to make sure that we're communicating to parents what it means to be a child. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that is that. Cheers to that. (laughs) Okay. Well, Tiffany. Well, Kristen. It's been fun. Oh, we have to do it. (laughs) We'll see you next time on that early morning the early childhood